before I introduce today's speaker, uh, I just want to mention that our next uh, colloquium, that will be the fourth and the last room for this semester, will be on December 11th, which is the second Tuesday of December. We will go back to Northgate Hall for that. And the speaker is Professor Takashi Asano from UC Davis. He's an expert on water recycling. Uh, um, and he has been recently a recipient of a very prestigious talk. That will be a very interesting talk, which will focus attention on the engineering aspect. And today's talk, uh, in keeping with our desire for having the breadth of understanding of water in California. Today is a talk about institutions, water institutions, and in particular, a very interesting multi-institutional institution known as CALFA. It's a very unique experiment on very large-scale water management in a very complex technological society which in its own right could be the seventh largest or sixth largest economy in the world. And the challenge of presenting that talk is falling on the shoulders of Mr. Patrick Wright, who is the chief or the director of CalFAC. Um, Mr. Wright uh, got his bachelor's degree in Oberlin College, then came to Berkeley, went to our own graduate school of public policy, the Goldman School of Public Policy. Went on to work with US EPA in San Francisco for a number of years. Then joined the state of California as the Deputy Secretary for Resources. And now finally, he's now, at the present time, he is the director of CalFed, an extraordinary institution with tremendous challenges <coughs> But that's what makes life interesting. It's been very kind of him to agree to come to Berkeley today and tell us about what Calfer is and what does it take to make it work. Thank you. Delighted to be back here on campus. I thought I'd actually park back up at the old school, but discovered that it was a construction zone, so uh, made my way to another place. Um, let me see if we can get set up here before we get going. That's not a good sign. <laughs> there we go. I'm relatively new at this uh, the high tech not what I want. Here we go. Okay. What, um, what I'm going to try to do in the time we have, it's a, it's a fairly, the CalFed Bay Delta program is a large comprehensive program. What I'm going to try to do is just give you a flavor in the short time we have of some of the key elements of the program, why it's different than most of the other major resource management programs that you may be familiar with and then spend a little bit of time to focus particularly on the Bay Area to give you a flavor of some of the things that are happening here. Um, just to start out, uh, we always start by emphasizing to folks the importance of the Bay Delta system, particularly from people who, who aren't from California. Um, the Delta as a whole doesn't quite have this evoke the same images as some of the other larger scale resource areas in the country, whether it be the Everglades or the Great Lakes or the Chesapeake or even the Pacific Northwest. But actually, when you think about it, um, its importance actually for the economy of both the state and the nation dwarfs those. The, the Delta provides drinking water for 22 million Californians, uh, hundreds of plant and animal species, 80% of the commercial salmon um, are caught in the, the Delta system, uh, $27 billion agricultural industry in California, which um, dwarfs the industry in any other state, uh, is largely dependent upon some 
supplies from the Delta, and of course the economy itself from Silicon Valley t um, on through the rest of the economy depends to, to some degree on the Delta. Um, but again, partly because it it both doesn't evoke the same images as other resource areas and also because it's got a lot of competition in California between Redwoods and Yosemite and the beaches. The Delta itself doesn't quite have the same uh, public awareness that some other areas do. So it's a continuing challenge for the program to educate folks on how important it is to both the economy and the environment of California. The program area of the Delta is also surprisingly vast. When most folks think of, of CalFed and the Delta, they think of the Delta itself. But in fact, as this graph shows, the areas of the state that depend on the Delta for all or part of their supplies covers the entire map that you see here. And this doesn't even include the fact that that portions of Los Angeles are of course dependent upon the Colorado River system as well and actions there can indirectly affect actions in the Delta system. Also actions up here in the Trinity River system also have major indirect impacts on the Delta. So it's a fairly large program area. When the, when the program was started they came up with this construct of the problem area and the solution area. As I'll talk about a little bit later we're moving away from that um, for a lot of different reasons and focusing more on regional strategies that uh, have more local support. The um, defining the Bay Delta conflict, the reason why we're here is because the Delta itself no longer functions as either a viable system from an environmental perspective or from a water delivery uh, perspective. Uh, after decades of water development, the system is in decline from an ecosystem perspective. We've got a number of species from several runs of salmon, steelhead, delta smelt are listed as either threatened or endangered under the State and Federal Endangered Species Acts. Water quality continues to, to degrade because the delta is a recipient from uh, agricultural sources and non-point sources up and down the state. And water supplies are increasingly reliable. Uh, farmers in the Central Valley, urban areas can no longer depend on having an adequate supply uh, given the level of uncertainty that characterizes the system. To try to deal with that, um, the agencies got together in towards the end of, actually it was a couple of years preceding that, but the actual announcement came at the end of 1994. The agencies and stakeholders brokered what amounts to a ceasefire in California's water wars. For about 20 or 30 years, very little water development took place in California since the state water project was developed in the 1960s. And there was very little progress, be partly because each of the major interest groups, urban, ag, and environmental in the state, were each powerful enough to block each other to prevent any progress being made, but none was powerful enough to get their agenda enacted. So from the environmental perspective, the environmental community was very successful in blocking new major dams, but they weren't successful in getting money and support for large-scale ecosystem restoration programs. The water community was relatively successful in blocking other projects, but weren't able to get any major projects online. And so this crisis came to, came to a head in the early 1990s with the additional listings of species under the Endangered Species Act, where the reliability of the state's water from both the fish perspective and a water supply perspective became so chaotic that a group of interest groups and agencies came together and negotiated what's now known or what was known then as the Bay Delta Accord, where in effect the agricultural community agreed to give up roughly a million acre feet of water more for the environment to protect endangered fish species in return for more certainty of supplies and, and more importantly uh, today in return for the promise of a long-term fix to the state's water supply picture which then grew into what's now known as the CalFed Bay Delta program. We also had a couple of bond acts enacted along the way, Prop 204, uh, mainly ecosystem protection funds and Prop 13, primarily water um, supply reliability funds that help pave the way for the CalFed program, which the framework for which was announced in June of 2000 by G Governor Davis and Secretary Babbitt. Um, it was finalized from a legal perspective in the so-called record of decision issued in late August of 2000 and we are now in 
uh, beginning of or middle of year two of implementation. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have a, an effective down payment on the program through Props 204 and 13 that we're drawing on. Unfortunately, um, although we have, a, we have a fair amount of money, over a half a billion dollars as you can see there in state money for each of the first two years, it's not balanced funding. Um, the, those bond acts were adopted before the CalFed plan went final and so what that means is we've got plenty of money in some areas, not enough in others and one of the things that's different about the CalFed plan is it's dependent upon having continuous balanced funding across the board and with the new fiscal realities that are set in on the state side and our continued challenges in getting federal money, maintaining a balanced funding and balanced progress is probably our greatest challenge overall. The, uh, the agencies that make up this consortium, what, what CalFed is, um, whoop, if I can go back here, um, the CalFed program itself doesn't actually exist legally as an entity. It's in a consortium of all these agencies that you see up here. And so what we literally do, and we had a meeting this morning of the uh, leadership of all these agencies, we meet every, at a mid-level every week and at a higher level every month um, to try to move all of these agencies together to try to meet the goals of the program. I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics, but from an organizational perspective, that's one of the things that's unique about this program. It's, it's trying to tie the various mandates of each of these agencies that are related to water in California and move them together to meet the goals of the framework agreement. We're trying to do that through four major program areas. Water supply reliability, ecosystem restoration, water quality, and levee system integrity. Those are the four overarching goals of the program, recognizing that each of these are linked. That in California water, you can't solve one problem without dealing with the other because, as I said before, the delta is the hub for the whole system. You can be doing a wonderful job in one area, but if, you don't, if you're not protecting your levees, then the whole system falls apart, as an example. From an implementation perspective, the program is implemented through the roughly nine or ten program areas you see over there on the right. Um, storage conveyance, etc., um, to begin making progress in each of those areas. But overall, uh, we try to focus on on the major the major four program elements to assure balanced progress. A couple of things that, that make this program different from even some of the large-scale programs you may have heard about in the Everglades or Great Lakes or Chesapeake Bay is one is the sheer size. Um, covering uh, most of California's land area, 70% of California's land area, um, gives us some challenges that don't exist in, in most uh, even coordinated programs. Secondly, we, as you saw, we've got over 20 state and federal agencies involved. When you think of even some of the other large-scale programs, they typically have a single focus, and it's usually ecosystem restoration, whether it's, as I said before, the Everglades, Great Lakes, Chesapeake, and usually they're dominated by one or two agencies. The Corps of Engineers or US EPA or Interior um, ours is different in the sense that it really is taking, because of the, f the four major goal areas, it takes all of those agencies to be at the table. Got 11 major program elements, each of which is, is larger than has ever been attempted, at least in California. We've also got extensive public and local involvement that shapes every aspect of the program. For each of those program areas you saw, each of the 10 or 11 programs, we have extensive public involvement in shaping each of those, each of those program areas. And then finally, um, budget uh, permitting, we've got an unprecedented commitment to both scientific review and program tracking. It is very rare in government government when funds are allocated for projects of any kind, much less water environment, that folks actually go out there and check to see if the programs are working. One of the things that we're committed to is going back, particularly on the, with the ecosystem restoration program, and evaluating our successes as we, as we spend money. We're up to, as I'll show you in a second, up to funding over 300 projects up and down the state. And we've actually got money set aside for the first time to go back and evaluate both how those individual projects are performing, but how they're performing um, collectively from a watershed basis and also from a system-wide basis and meeting our goals. And then finally, 
Um, a commitment to independent scientific review of all major aspects of the program. We have peer review built in to all of our proposals. That is also extremely rare. It is fairly common also when bond acts are enacted, and we faced this earlier last year, that the Department of Water Resources, for example, it's got you know, a couple hundred million dollars to spend on groundwater projects. First applicant that comes in the door that meets the minimum criteria, they write a check. CalFed program said, no, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to have a public review process. We're going to have a competitive grants process. And we're going to have independent scientific review of all those projects. So hopefully over time, the program will, will be a new way of doing business for our agencies. It will no longer be each individual agency doing its own program with their own constituencies, but it's a collective program in which we're trying to get the best bang for our buck from a scientific perspective and an economic perspective as well. Let me walk you through each of the major program elements, starting with water supply reliability. Um, our goal here is to increase water supplies by nearly 3 million acre feet through surface and groundwater storage and water use efficiency projects. We've got a number of projects that are underway um, in each of these areas to try to improve the reliability of the state supply and also to create a integrated operations plan where we bring together the fisheries agencies, the National Marine Fisheries Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, the State Department of Fish and Game, the Bureau of Reclamation, and the Department of Water Resources all together to try to operate the system in ways that help fish and help improve water supply reliability. Uh, traditionally, the way water project operations have worked is you have the Bureau of Reclamation and DWR over in one corner operating the system with fisheries as a constraint on their operations, trying to optimize deliveries and they've got this fish stuff out there that's sort of a constraint that they'd rather not have but they've got to deal with. New way of doing business is you've got all those agencies working together to try to do both. And with, with California's um, uncertain hydrology, there's a, there's a tremendous amount that can be done to actually balance um, operations so you can actually meet both needs because fish have just as much of a need for reliable supply as the water community and their needs can be just as unpredictable dependent upon when storms come, weather comes, etc. So folks are working hard to try to come up with a new way of, of operating the system that works better for both. Some of the potential actions that we've got underway from a water supply reliability uh, perspective are, again, a, a huge commitment to water use efficiency to make sure we're effectively using our existing supplies before we go out and, and build more facilities um, is, is a key element of the program. And conveyance and operational improvements and uh, all told, the, the total is up to, as I said before, up to 3 million acre feet, acre feet per year. Um, on average. This, this takes you through a couple of the, and I'll show you a map in a second, of the new storage projects. Um, Shasta Reservoir uh, is, a, is a potential project to be expanded up in the Sacramento Valley along with the Sites Reservoir projects which, which would be a new reservoir. There's also potentially plans to enlarge Los Vaqueros Reservoir in the East Bay and an in-delta storage project that would turn some delta islands into, into a storage project. So those are the ones that at this point have the most potential but are still awaiting in-depth environmental review um, before we're ready to, to move ahead on those. Um, and this gives you a sense um, from, a, from a geographic perspective on or where some of these projects are. Shasta in the north. Uh, some of the Bay Area projects down here and the triangles are the, where the water use efficiency grants are scattered throughout the state. We're also negotiating groundwater MOUs with a number of counties. Um, California does not have much of a history of groundwater management and I think that's going to be an area in the future where a lot more attention is paid, particularly as the, the costs become more apparent of build and the environmental impacts of building more surface storage projects. So, one of the themes here is that no one tool is being seen as the, the answer or the ticket. It's going to take progress on a whole number of fronts to try to increase the state's uh, water supply reliability picture. Ecosystem restoration. Um, our goal here, of course, is to try to not only get fish, um, to protect endangered fish, but actually to promote their recovery. Uh, through a wide range of programs, including um, an innovative program called the Environmental Water Account, where what the CalFed program is doing is setting aside a block of water that's there every year for fish 
when they need it as opposed to taking a more traditional regulatory approach. One of the problems with the traditional way that standards are set for fish is particularly with the pumping plants where they are in the South Delta is that it's very unpredictable from both the fish perspective and a water supply perspective. What that, me what has, what that has meant in the past is that if you've got fish that are subject to being entrained at the state and federal pumping plants that export water to Southern California, you create a very unpredictable situation for the state and federal water projects, which are then subject to be shut down at any moment. So the idea here was if we can set aside a block of water through willing seller, willing buyer, buyer transactions, we can then allocate that water for fish when they need it, when they begin migrating down the system without adversely affecting water supply. So you can tell the water supply community, you have a, in general, a fairly firm supply independent of what fish are going to need uh, because we've got a block of water that has been set aside as the year begins for fish. So it's a creative new non-regulatory approach that we think will actually work better for fish because the water will be there and also work better for the water supply community because their reliability will be significantly improved. This gives you a flavor of the full range of um, ecosystem restoration projects over, uh, I think this has now been, been updated, but as of this point, 326 projects for $336 million just in the last four or five years. A truly staggering amount of activity um, that we're just beginning to try to publicize better, but um, a tremendous amount of restoration work that's being done up and down the valley to improve the health of the ecosystem. Um, for anadromous fish species and other, other uh, fish and wildlife. And then finally, water quality, certainly a key uh, aim of the program is to try to improve the drinking water supplies for, for all the folks in California who depend on the Delta for all or part of their supplies. And that means everything from conveyance improvements to watershed projects, ag drainage projects, treatment technologies, et cetera, um, to try to meet the goals of the program. This gives you again a flavor, at least some of the range of projects that are, that are underway. And then finally, uh, levy system integrity. Uh, one of the key, key goals of the program that is often overlooked is to try to improve the stability of delta levees. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually been out to the delta, but one of the things that's most surprising to people who go out there for the first time is many, if not most of them, are now well below sea level. So you'll be traveling along a delta road and you will be looking down on the delta islands um, and seeing the water on one side up at this level and because of the peat soils that have, that have eroded over time through agricultural activity. So maintaining those, those delta um, levees and islands is hugely important from a, both a water supply perspective and an ecosystem perspective because if those delta levees flood what you get is a rush of seawater into the delta which then affects the drinking water of all the folks in the state that depend on the delta um, for a portion of their supplies. This gives you a, just a flavor of some of the many delta um, levy restoration projects underway. These next couple gra graphics sort of give you a sense. This one doesn't quite show you the, the sea level issue, but it gives you a sense of what it's like out there during a, a not a typical um, winter storm where they're, they're trying here to try to keep that uh, levy in shape. What this next graphic shows you is a new way of doing business for a levee restoration program to try to use levee restoration um, or levee maintenance as an opportunity to also do ecosystem restoration. This is an example of what's called a setback levee where it, instead of just adding more rock to the existing levee to actually set it back and then over time when that grows in you get this which is much better from a flood perspective because it's set back, but it's also much better from a habitat perspective. Instead of just having bare rock up against the, the river or the channel, you've got a fairly lush area that is, that is a nice breeding area for, for fish and wildlife. All this, of course, costs a lot of money to be able to do this kind of stuff. And the CalFed plan, uh, for good or for bad, was negotiated at the time when the state and federal budget surpluses were at their height. So we, we thought big and we came up with a roughly $9 billion program to try to meet all the goals that I've talked about. Um, that's probably not going to be a realistic 
um, estimate of what we're actually going to get. Fortunately, with the two bond acts, we're, we're off to a pretty good start in having uh, over half a billion in the first two years. We'll see over time, but it does take quite a bit of money to, to fund these projects. And we're also still sorting through uh, the very controversial issue of who's going who's gonna to bear the price tag for all this. Um, a lot of the money, uh, particularly for the storage and conveyance projects, right now they're in the planning stage. And so the state and federal governments are picking up the tab. But there's going to be an expectation that if we decide to move to construction that the beneficiaries of those projects will pay the cost. And it's going to be quite a, quite a battle over defining who those beneficiaries are and what their relative shares are. One of the things that will, that will make this more challenging is we expect if and when some of these big projects are built that they will have shared benefits. For instance, the environment will get a piece of any new conveyance pro projects or storage projects. So trying to work through the calculations on what that implies for public funding versus us user funding is going to be um, an interesting uh, discussion. So as I said before, we've, we've had a strong first start in the first year. Uh, we've allocated all told over half a billion dollars, uh, 300 million for water supply and water quality and over 150 million for ecosystem restoration projects. We've got major planning projects underway for both surface and groundwater projects. The environmental water count is off and running and a whole number of grant, grant programs in each of the areas that I've talked about. Now let me turn um, for sort of the, the second half of uh, the discussion about new directions um, of CalFed and where we're heading. There was somewhat of, a, of an impression as this process has evolved, even though it was state and federal driven with a tremendous amount of stakeholder participation, that the agencies themselves would take responsibility for conducting all these studies, building all these projects, etc. One of the things that we're finding is that the CalFed program is not a lot different than what's happening nationwide with, res with respect to ecosystem restoration in the sense that local groups are every day more and more seizing the initiative. And one of the things that we want to take advantage of in the CalFed program is that local involvement. We're dealing in an area when it comes to government action, um, unlike perhaps the coast of California, we're dealing with counties in the Central Valley and we're dealing with counties in the upper watersheds for which the state and federal governments are not their favorite partners. We're dealing with an area where in some of these counties 80 to 90 percent of their land is owned by the federal government. And so having the state and federal government show up to say we're going to build these projects, etc., doesn't go over real well. Um, and not just from an ecosystem perspective, when you think of groundwater in California, which is very jealously guarded at the local level, you'd be amazed at the difference if you send out a Bureau of Reclamation employee and say, here would be a nice spot for a groundwater project, as they tried to do in Madera County a couple of years ago. They're still facing the impacts of that, of that failed project and the vision that the locals created of black helicopters and federal land grabs and all that. The same is true with our ecosystem program. If we send out the Fish and Wildlife Service and say, here would be a nice place to have a refuge, you get an immediate backlash. But if the exact same proposal is submitted by a local land trust, it flies through the system. So one of the things that we're trying to do more and more is to maximize local involvement. If we can put the state and federal agencies in a position of setting the goals, providing the science, providing technical assistance, making sure we have a balanced and integrated program, but depend on local involvement to the maximum extent possible in implementing the program, we get a lot more buy-in, much more cost-effective, much more politically prop popular with members of the legislature and the Congress who see the program as a way of helping address local issues and needs as opposed to a top-down program. So this is a key, key new um, element of the program that I've been pushing real hard since I started about a year ago. We're focusing on five areas, five geographic areas where we're encouraging local groups to get together and think on a large scale. The Sacramento River watershed, the Delta, the Bay Area, the San Joaquin and Southern California. Each of, these lar each of these areas is large enough to think big but also small enough to have fairly different goals and objectives in mind when it comes, comes to where their water comes from and, and what their needs are. What I'm going to what I'll do is I'll just give you a couple of highlights in each region and then focus a little bit more on the Bay Area. In the Sac Valley, for, for instance, there's 
there's great fear out there about their water being shipped south to Southern California. And so what we hear more and more from folks in the Sac Valley is, we're realistic, we understand that water is going to continue to flow south to the ag industry and to Southern California, but we want to make sure that our needs are taken care of first. So our answer is fine, let's develop a Sac Valley water management strategy that includes potentially surface storage projects, groundwater projects, ecosystem restoration, groundwater banking, flood management, etc. So there's a forum that's now underway in the Sac Valley to try to pull that together into an integrated water management strategy for the Sac Valley uh, to make sure their long-term needs are being met. And then in addition, of course, there are watershed groups up and down the Sac Valley. Butte Creek, Battle Creek, Deer Creek, there's a whole number of, 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 of uh, locally based watershed um, projects that are having great success up and down the valley and restoring um, salmon and other fish species. In the Delta, um, the key there or the, the challenge there is to try to develop a plan for the Delta that not only helps make the Delta work as the hub of the state's water supply system, but also helps address local needs, which are often in conflict. Um, we're trying to increase um, the, the ability of the system to work both for fish and for water supply. We're doing that through a variety of things, through flood management, through habitat restoration, through conveyance improvements that make it easier to move water through the system, a whole range of issues um, that are we're working closely with the locals on to meet their interests, but also to meet the broader needs of the state that, dep that depends on the Delta for their supplies. In the San Joaquin um, Valley, a lot of the action is trying to restore the San Joaquin, one of the largest but also one of the most degraded rivers in the state. Um, so a whole range of activities underway to try to improve ecosystem management and flood management on the San Joaquin system, to also look at groundwater banking when there's a lot of potential there, um, and some exchange programs where there's some potential, for example, for um, areas down in the southern San Joaquin to take their water directly from the Sierra foothills um, rather than from up in the Delta and then to have Southern California interest um, work in partnership with the San Joaquin Valley so that Southern California doesn't necessarily have to rely on the Delta but can take water um, from some of the same areas. So there's a lot of innovative projects that are underway to try to uh, maximize use of their existing conveyance systems um, to work better for multiple purposes. And then finally, in Southern California, um, a number of water use efficiency projects. The key in Southern California is, at least from their perspective, is to try to reduce their dependence on the Delta. To the extent to which they depend on the Delta for all or part of their supply, it's subject to a lot of the issues we've talked about earlier. So the extent to which they can increase their commitment to water use efficiency, water, watershed management, et cetera, water transfers, it firms up their water supply. The city of LA, as an example, is using the same amount of water as it did 20 years ago, even with the tremendous population growth they've had. If we can duplicate that through the rest of Southern California and in Northern California, it'll do a lot to take the pressure off the Delta as a source of supply throughout the state. And in the Bay Area, um, I'll spend just a few remaining moments on, on focusing on what we're trying to do here. Um, a whole range of projects both to try to increase the efficiency of the current plumbing systems that serve the Bay Area, water treatment, water conservation, and habitat projects uh, throughout the, uh, the Bay Delta watershed. One of the, um, the first things you, that the, f the folks learn about the Bay Area watershed is that there are so many different systems that are overlapping. For, and this gives you a good, let me go back here. Okay, skipped a couple. This gives you an overview of all the different systems, and I think the next couple of graphs take you through them. I've got them one by one. They may be out of order. Contra Costa takes most of its water directly from the Delta. East Bay Mud, which serves the East Bay, of course, takes its water from the McKellamy River um, up in the, the Sierra Foothills. San Francisco has its own separate aqueduct that takes its water from Yosemite and Hetch Hetchy. Santa Clara takes its water from half from local sources and the remaining portion from the state and federal pumping systems. 
And what you get from that is widely different water sources and water quality. Anybody that looks at that earlier map of all the systems says there's got to be a better way. If, if, if we design this thing for water quality and water supply for the region as a whole, you obviously wouldn't design six different systems. So what we're trying to do is work on a more integrated system with connections between the systems to both improve the quality and quantity of supplies. The challenge there though is that each of these separate systems, not unlike transportation planning, has their own elected board. And their own elected boards and their mandates and their history over time is to protect their system. So if you're San Francisco and you get high quality water from Hetch Hetchy, the last thing you wanted to be doing is talking to Contra Costa about taking that dirty delta water, as an example. But if you're Santa Clara Valley and you get your, you're growing and you get your water from a whole number of sources, well then maybe you have more interest in, in, in working in partnership with some of the other agencies. So, it's, uh, it's a very difficult dance with the Bay Area agencies, but it's an example of what CalFed is trying to do, is to try to bring all of these parties together to see if we can uh, work out ways that they can work better together. In the absence of working out agreements, what happens is each of these agencies then puts stress on the system, as opposed to working together to promote connections between their agencies. Um, and you get lawsuits, you get litigation, you get a whole number of things. Uh, East Bay Mud, as an example, has been fighting for 30 or 40 years to try to get more water from the American River to supplement the supply, as opposed to working out a partnership agreement from one of the other Bay Area member agencies. So we hope through the CalFed program to give them uh, the opportunity to try to work out um, an arrangement uh, with the other Bay Area ra um, agencies. So some of the ways we might do that is to connect the Los Vaqueros uh, re Reservoir to the South Bay Aqueduct, to connect the Hetch Hetchy to uh, system to the South Bay Aqueduct, to expand the South Bay Aqueduct. Um, all of these projects have the potential to both improve water quality and water supply reliability. So we're in the middle of a study right now called the Bay Area Blending and Exchange, or BABE for short, uh, to, uh, to a evaluate the potential for these types of inter, inter ties and, and connections among the Bay Area agencies. Um, again, uh, one part of that may end up being um, expanding Los Vaqueros Reservoir um, to try to serve the needs of a broader set of folks in the, in the Bay Area. Um, Potential benefits are it could provide some storage for the environmental water account that I talked about earlier, as well as reliability and flexibility for the Bay Area agencies. As with everything else, we're doing this through a local collaborative process with all the agencies at the table and all the major stakeholder groups in the Bay Area. Uh, just to give you a flavor of some of the other things going on in the Bay Area, strong commitment to water use efficiency. This gives you a, a flavor of some of the projects that have been uh, funded around the Bay, everything from um, conservation at schools to landscapes to um, um, single flush toilets, etc. cetera. Uh, watershed projects, um, 17 million just in the last uh, year or two uh, between watershed, I guess that's watershed and ecosystem restoration projects. This is a view of the, uh, the North Bay and some of the larger scale projects that are underway and some of the dollar amounts. Um, major restoration work happening in uh, San Pablo Bay and also in Sassoon Bay where we've got a number of different projects to try to restore the health of the uh, nursery area, the estuary. And then uh, this gives you a flavor of some of the major watersheds and some, some of the programs that are underway. Um, and some of the dollar amounts. Uh, 12 projects for four and a half million just in the first year alone. So that gives you, I think that's it. That gives you a little bit of a flavor. It's a big program. Um, a lot going on um, both statewide and in the Bay Area. Um, the keys from our perspective are, of course, funding. Um, what makes this work is money to do all this. What makes this also work is people and leadership from the agencies. My old boss, uh, the regional director at EPA, used to have a saying of, that what we need more of is not ecosystem management, but ecosystem management. <laughs> and uh, a lot of what we do is to try to take 20 agencies that are, all have their own separate missions and mandates and try to pull them together in support of the goals up here. Um, but a lot of it does come down to people and money. Um, this kind of stuff can happen if you've got the right people in place and you've got the resources available to try to make it happen.
So I encourage you all to at least uh, be aware of what's happening in the, in the water world, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you have. So you can have half hour for questions if you want it. So. Sure. I just have a question about um, like urban water use efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, if there's any effort that's been done so far or you're thinking about in the future of, uh, I guess, maybe some like local reliance on water that comes into cities. Mm -hmm. from rain and different right. There's a large, um, there's a large um, process that isn't well defined here. Um, to establish what are called urban best management practices, to, to have urban agencies certify that they're implementing all water management actions that are cost effective locally, and if they're not, then their funding from CalFed is at risk. It's a major element of the water use efficiency program, and part of the overall deal with respect to water use efficiency on the one hand and storage projects on the other, that to get your various permits for storage projects, folks need to certify that they're doing everything they can from a water use efficiency perspective. So there's a lot going on from both an ag perspective where for the first time we're pushing measurement of ag water use, water use and um, there's, there's a lot of folks in the, in the valley that still don't meter their water. Um, so we're making a lot of progress on both measuring and demanding uh, stronger ag water use efficiency as well as urban water use efficiency as part of the, the package deal. One of the more innovative projects that's also happening is in, in Southern California is folks are understanding that in the winter they spend billions of dollars of taking water and getting it out to sea and then in the summer they spend billions of dollars trying to import water from Northern California and so some of the more creative projects down there are actually taking some of those winter flood flows that would otherwise go out to sea and actually cause beach closures and put it in the ground so that they've got it there um, in the summer or to even do locally on individual houses they've got cisterns and things like that they've got um, they're moving into schools and trying to get rid of pavement so that more water actually flows down. Um, imperme impermeable surface area is sort of the new buzzword in non-point source uh, pollution control. The more impervious surface area um, there is, the more of a problem you have with runoff. So there's a lot of creative stuff happening in the, in the water use efficiency field. But I, I also add, as, as Professor Handelman will tell you, is a lot of that is a function of price. It is very difficult to try to encourage people, particularly in the ag community, who get very, very low cost water to conserve. Some of the areas in the San Joaquin Valley who have the least senior water rights, whose water rights, whose water supplies are threatened every year by weather or by fish needs are some of the most efficient in the world. But you've also got some places in California where folks are just using way more than they need and because we don't have the proper price signals. So we set up a system, for better or for worse, where grants are available for areas to implement programs that aren't cost effective locally but might make sense from a global perspective and then loans um, for everybody else. So there's a, there's a bunch of what I would call incremental steps to try to deal with the fact that we don't have the proper price signals but certainly um, more will need to be done. Sure. About um, the ag runoff, as much as ag efficiency is really important, some of the runoff is necessary for mm -hmm. extra for the Salton Sea and for Castro Sound. Right. Some of those areas, and what you're proposing to do about that, um, and how you're, you're going to sort of mitigate because there are already right. high selenium levels and a lot of problems. Yeah, it's a good question that, um, that comes up quite a bit when we, we start talking about things like lining canals and other large-scale water use efficiency programs is you've had, you've had situations where the environment has come to benefit over time from the slop or inefficiency in our conveyance system. So how do you deal with that? It's a third-party impact that's not unlike some of the communities that are displaced through water transfers. Generally the answer is if the need is there it should be met directly. That what you don't want to do is continue a 
um, for instance, salt and sea. You want to make sure salt and sea gets the water it needs. You don't necessarily want to give salt and sea the water it needs by depending upon an inefficient system. So overall, I think there's more of a movement towards defining what those needs are, uh, for at least from an environmental perspective, and trying to meet them directly rather than indirectly subsidize them through an inefficient system. But it differs all over the place, and it, it gets into very complicated water rights rules as to whose water rights are more senior than, than others when you get into those situations. But it is a very difficult issue. Salt and Sea is probably the most um, prominent. For those of you who don't know, there's a, there's a deal underway between San Diego and the Imperial Irrigation District for San Diego to go in and introduce irrigation improvements into the uh, Imperial Valley. Uh, and in return basically take the water that's saved. The problem with that is that the Salton Sea, which, has, which was an accident of, uh, at the turn of the century when the Colorado River um, blew a levee, has grown over time to become one of the most valuable wetlands areas in the state, if not the nation. So the issue is you can, you can introduce some significant improvements from an irrigation efficiency perspective, but potentially at the risk of not drying up the sea, but increasing its salinity to a point where it will no longer function. So it's a, it's a very challenging issue. Hopefully they'll figure out a way to do both. Um, but again, money is going to be a major obstacle there. Sure. Sorry. Um, um, I just, I've heard people speculate that if there's another drought, or a severe drought for over two years, that with the population of California, we won't be able to supply water. For everyone, with the storage capacity that we have now, um, one of the things you said was water supply reliability. What kind of stuff is going on to cap that? Well, one of our challenges is it's going to take several years for a lot of the projects that you've seen up here to, to be online. So. In the, in the short term, we're going to have to depend on the environmental water account and some of our uh, water transfers and, and other short-term mechanisms to try to reduce the impact of an extended drought if it hits. We can probably get through another reasonably dry year. Um, we'll have shortages in some areas, those areas that have less senior water rights than others will have greater shortages than others. The urban areas in California, I think, have enough water in storage right now that they'll generally be okay. If we get beyond another year though, it's going to be a much more serious situation and we certainly by then won't have the kind of conveyance and, and other improvements online that are sufficient to deal with it. So it's, uh, it's going to be a challenge also to maintain support for a program whose payoff is a few years out if in fact we're in the middle of a drought situation or a flood situation. I mean one of the, the lessons of California water is the public and the voters only pay attention if you have a droughts or floods. And so to try to maintain momentum when you've got average years is really difficult. So we'll see. Sure. So Southern California has been able to adjudicate their, their, river ba their uh, groundwater basins but it doesn't seem to uh, have been done in the, the San Joaquin Valley. What, what's your read on that? It's a challenge. Um, there's no, as I said before, there's not a lot of precedent for groundwater management in California. What, what we are trying to do is use more of a, a carrot and stick approach to say that money from the state for groundwater projects is only going to flow to areas that have groundwater management plans, as an example, and to try to um, avoid situations of funding projects that just ends up leading to endless litigation because they haven't worked out arrangements with their neighbors, etc. Which is very common in California to have a groundwater basin adjudicated for 20 or 30 years. So in the end there's going to need to be some groundwater regulation in California and I think what will end up happening is the extent to which our program and others sink a tremendous amount of money from the water bond into groundwater, folks will recognize on their own that they're going to need some more policies and some more rules um, to make those projects work because it's just going to be too important, particularly if it stays dry. But as with everything else, it's going to take some kind of a crisis or a horror story to prompt action. Just to make a generic call for groundwater management doesn't do it. It's going to need to have some pretty strong carrots and sticks and or some kind of a, a crisis to make it happen. Sure. In, in some of this, so like talking about the environmental water account um, and the notion in California that, that the water is a, is a public resource or a public trust mm -hmm. resource, um, there, there seems to be a problem with the public 
having to buy back its own heritage. And um, you know, and what what happened with the Environmental Water Account this year? It, it wasn't so healthy for that winter run. Um, and you know, does the money do it, or is there a need for a, a deeper sort of thought about how we treat water? Yeah, no, that's a good point. I think one of the things that we struggle with is. Um, who bears responsibility for providing more water, whether it's for fish or for, for um, folks in the ag or urban areas. I think the way this environmental water account is constructed is it's an amount of water that's generally more than would be available for fish through the traditional regulatory processes. So that's the argument for public funding. Um, but one could argue that um, the cost should be borne by and it has been argued by the water users um, to support that. On the other hand, folks, that goes to how strongly you believe Delta exports and the water community are responsible for the declines. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough issue. Um, I think over time, as if, if in fact the account works better, I think you'll get a more stable, reliable source of funding through a new fee or something like that because regardless of how you feel about the issue of who should pay for e ecosystem restoration, there isn't going to be public funds available. So it's only going to be funded on a continuous basis as if there is some kind of a tax or a fee that generates a, a stable and reliable revenue source. But I think when you're starting with a new innovative program to convince people to get on board, you got to use public funding. To expect to assess a tax or a fee on something that's brand new, is innovative, and may or may not work is a real tough sell. But over time, hopefully we'll move to more of a, a user-based system. In the back? Um, I was just wondering, you talked about um, going back and monitoring the project. Right. Uh, that, that I was wondering what sort of criteria you have, have you set up for establishing whether a project is a success or not. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things we're doing is we're trying to focus our ecosystem program on what we're calling signature projects, where you can go into an area and fund projects at a scale where you can actually have measurable impacts. And so for, as an example, we've gone into a couple of watersheds on the Sacramento River uh, known as Butte Creek and Battle Creek, where we've actually are taking out a whole series of diversions, small diversions that were put in by PG&E and other power folks, and then going in afterwards and monitoring the extent to which salmon are rebounding. And we've actually got some initial numbers back from, from a couple of those tributaries that show that the fish counts are way up. Uh, even after you fact, factor out the difference in hydrology. So those are really our best tools right now of, of monitoring how well the projects are working collectively. But a lot more work needs to be done in developing performance standards throughout the system, and not just for, for the ecosystem program, but for all the programs to measure success. But it's, it's challenging. It's just uh, as challenging as setting the plan itself is trying to reach agreement on what the, what the goals and what the standards of success should be. I want to ask uh, your thoughts about the future and the institutional setting. Mm -hmm. Just preface this sure. by saying, I think we first met in uh, 1986 or 87 in the Bay Delta hearings. Mm -hmm. That was a decision process by the state water board to right. decide on diversion. Right. And you know, one interpretation is that CalFed came about because of a stalemate right. in, in state decision making. Right. Um, and it uh, required sort of federal intervention right. when the state had uh, broken. Uh, obviously, liaison with state agencies and multi-agency right. liaison is a desirable thing. Right. But the inability of the state to come to a, uh, a decision you know, um, one doesn't bode well for California or any other state. And so the question is, is CalFed a substitute for the state arranging things so that it can actually make deci management decisions on its own resources without the feds coming along um, to impose order? Um, I think in part. Um, and I think what's happening with CalFed is not a lot different than what's happening throughout the West where these collaborative processes are springing up all over the place. The, the State Water Resources Control Board up until 10 years ago was the forum for dealing with water issues in California. 
you it was a judicatory process where the different parties came in they make their they made their case and the state board made the decision well what what happened over time is people realized that that was it was a recipe for for gridlock and for conflict because it's in everybody's interest in going through that process to to attack each other and overstate their case and go through a very very um, very difficult process and they've discovered often that they can negotiate a better solution quickly more quickly and easier than they can through going through the state boards process I think if you look at California water 10 years ago the and and before the state water board was the forum and it was the classic way that government works. You go before the state board, you make your case, and make a decision. But when you look at the major accomplishments in California water in the last 10 or 15 years, none of them came from the state board. You look at the Mona Lake decision, you look at the Bay Delta Court, you look at the, the um, Metropolitan Water District deal with IID, um, you look at the new Phase 8 agreement, as it's called, in the Sacramento Valley. All of these are very conscious attempts to avoid the state board. And the stakeholder groups in California are very open about that. They get together, they negotiate deals explicitly for the purpose of avoiding a 10 to 20 year legal battle before the state water board. And so I think it's a function both of the way the state board itself as opposed to state government is designed, um, but it's also I think a function of the fact that Groups throughout California, throughout the West, throughout the country are realizing that to get anything done, particularly something as complex as California water where you've got eco issues and water issues and you've got 20 different agencies, you need to have a collaborative process. You need to have all the agencies on board, you need to have it. You don't have to have a consensus and I certainly never use the word consensus when it's associated with CalFed. I mean I think that was the early hope and that was the early lingo. My message is for anything to happen successfully, you've got to have broad based support. Doesn't mean you have to have everybody on board, but you've got to have broad based support of the key agencies and the key interest groups. And if you can do that, you can have success and you can buffer yourself. And this is really the key to CalFed is you can buffer yourself from changes of administrations and changes in legislature and Congress. Because what used to happen in California water and what would happen in resource management is you get a new administration in reverse in policy, then you get a new Congress in, and you reverse and you go back, and you go back, and you go back. If you've got a forum where everybody's at the table um, agreeing on the goals with maybe some differences of opinion about exactly how to get there, to some degree you can insulate yourself from those swings from legisla legislator to legislature session and from administration to administration. When, when Governor Davis came in, I think there was an expectation on the part of the environmental community that there would be this huge swing. But with a plan in place, it's a collaborative plan that has broad-based support, it's pretty hard for a new administration to come in and say no. We don't like that collaborative process. We want to do something different. And I think the same is true with the new Bush administration. Even though they haven't put their full stamp of approval on the plan and they're scared to death of the price tag, boy, they know what will happen if they say they're not supportive of it. They'll get every editorial paper, editorial board in California saying it was the Bush administration that killed this hope for California's water future. So it really, it really helps build that kind of support. It also of course means you got to make trade-offs and that's very difficult for a lot of the stakeholder groups who have power in Washington and want to use it. Um, but you know our message is no you got to be at the table you can't do end runs to the California legislature or, or Washington which is a tough sell every time a new administration or new Congress comes in and that's I'd say is the other challenge of CalFed that's related to funding is it's really hard for folks to resist to try to get what they didn't get out of the CalFed plan through Congress or the legislature. So if you're the environmental community or the Democrats who you see at these huge majorities in the California legislature, we can get more, well, they need to be reminded, well, you got a Republican majority in Congress and they can play that game too with the new administration back there. And so I am fine side. <laughs> Which was the, it wasn't the Bush administration trying to sabotage CalFed, it was Diane Feinstein. Well, wow. um, so, you know, that right. doesn't. Right, but the, the, the message is the message is to both sides that 
we've got a framework here that can work. There's plenty of flexibility within the framework to try to put a new administration or a new Congress's stamp on the plan. But if they go too far, as some of the bills in Congress do, it threatens the whole thing. I, I had somebody tell me in, um, at, a, at a breakfast meeting a couple of months ago in relationship to the new federal bill, well, it's just a matter of counting votes, isn't it? And I said, well, it might be just a matter of counting votes in Washington, but then how's the California legislature going to react having supported this plan if the Congress goes in a different direction? They're going to bounce back and either say, you just lost your funding because it's now for a different plan, or they're going to want to put their different stamp on it. So a real challenge for us is to try to persuade both the legislatures and Cal legislative folks in California and also the Congress um, to stick with the plan. That's a very difficult sell to members of Congress, though, to walk into a congressional office and say, we want you to bless this plan that was negotiated in California and not put your stamp on it, not try to do the, you know, the usual vote counting and amendment process where everybody gets a little piece of something. It's, it's a real challenge, and it's one of the reasons why we've gotten very little money out of Washington in the last two years, is to try to convince members of Congress who weren't out here negotiating the deal that they should, in effect, rubber stamp the deal that was, that was cut out here. But so far, um, we, we haven't had a bill passed that, uh, that we think undermines the program, but it's, there's certainly that potential if folks, um, if folks don't agree um, with the framework that we've laid out. And that, given that uh, potential schism between the California legislature and Congress, why not either nationalize the state water systems or statize, if you will, the state's water systems and others, uh, get ownership over the uh, Central Valley project, for example? Well, I mean, that has been talked about um, periodically over the last uh, couple of decades of transferring ownership from the federal system to the state, but you're still going to have a whole range of federal, environmental, and other statutes that are going to apply. I think in the end, you're going to have to have the state and federal governments speaking with one voice, or you're going to have endless conflict. Um, it's just the nature of the system in California. Even if the facilities themselves were transferred, you still have an amazing amount of authority on the federal side. And I frankly think that's helpful. I mean, it is an estuary of national significance, and you wouldn't want it to be a 100% state-driven system. I think you want that national funding and that national stamp of, of approval on it. 